Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Second Baptist Church's Wednesday night study. Uh, tonight, we're going to be uh, taking a break from our look at Ecclesiastes, and uh, we're going to address racial injustice. And uh, Ron Capers, who's a member of Second Baptist Church and who's served on uh, many leadership uh, in many leadership posts, is here to help us. I want to start by reading a scripture, uh, Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew Scriptures, chapter 58, verses 6 through 12. I think it's a good way to start our time off. And Isaiah in 58 is talking about how people are saying, uh, you know, we, we, we are following God. We're doing all the rituals. We're doing all the fasts. So that's when you fast from food for a spiritual purpose. And this is God's response in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless uh, poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desires in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Let's begin our time of prayer. Dear Lord, um, our world is broken. Violence begets violence. And Lord, we pray that your healing gospel would go out and hearts would be changed. Lord, we repent for not mourning with those who mourn. Lord, we repent of, not, of, of caring more for our comforts than the lives of your image bearers. And Lord, we pray for leaders at all levels. Lord, we pray for uh, the president and the, uh, the Congress on the national level. We pray for our governor. We pray for the local leaders as they make so many difficult decisions. Lord, with the pandemic, but also dealing with, with racial inequality, Lord, with riots and violence. Give them wisdom. Lord, we pray for pastors, uh, for the wisdom to be biblical without falling into any particular political camp. Lord, as we try to stay true to your word and extend your kingdom and not our own. And Lord, we put this time into your hands. We pray for open hearts and open minds that you would help us to draw closer to you. And Lord, that you would give us again the soft hearts to love one another. And Lord, to seek your way and your path, a path of justice, a path of love, and a path of peace. Lord, we put this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, again, Ron Capers is a member of our church, and you've served Second Baptist Church in many capacities. Uh, so, Ron, um, tell us about yourself. Just, you know, what, what do you do? Where are you from? All of that. But in case some folks don't know you, in our church, like those who aren't sure, we, we have two services, and you're more of a second service guy. So maybe there's some people watching in the first service, and they might not have uh, known you well. What, tell us about yourself. My name is Ron Capers. Uh, I'm from New York. I grew up in Harlem. East Harlem, and um, mom and dad still live in Harlem. Grew up in my mother's household with my two sisters, two of my sisters and my brother. I have three siblings, um, six siblings, three brothers and three sisters. Um, the two other brothers um, grew up in my, my father's household with my stepmother and my father, and in my household, in my mother's household, is my mom and stepfather, all of them get along. I know people think that parents 
sometimes there's friction and stuff, but not in this case. You wouldn't even know the difference, but they all get along. And um, close knit family, a lot of aunts and uncles. I have an older sister, haven't met her yet in my life, um, but hopefully we do meet each other at some point. And my other siblings, the five of us, are very tight as well. And have a few nieces and nephews as well. Um, as far as work goes, I um, work for a nonprofit agency. I'm a program director there, working with a group of guys in the residential program, uh, ages 60 to 81, um, and a good group of people. Uh, and I've uh, been there for about a year now, and I uh, moved up here to Massachusetts uh, about 20 years ago. I uh, moved up here to Massachusetts, and been up here since. Still a New Yorker no matter what, but um, but this is home at this point. Uh, and that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And you recently got married. Recently got married, yeah. And I have a wife. Uh, we got married last year in January, 26. Uh, I have a wife and four stepsons. And ages 24, 19, 16, and 13, all boys, and uh, three of them in the household. Uh, so uh, I still continue to get parental training for my wife, and um, she stays on me about that. I thank you and love you for that. Um, but she pretty much runs the household. Um, <laughs> Smart man. Um, so, uh, but she's also a believer, and and also has a story to tell as well. I'm sure the world will hear it one day. And um, she's 100% behind me and supports me as well, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ron, I really appreciate you being here because, um, you know, you, you normally are a part of our Wednesday night studies anyhow, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's appropriate as, as, you're gonna, as you help us um, think through a problem that's really taken center stage, you know, in the United States uh, these last couple of weeks, and that, that issue being the unequal treatment of blacks in America, um, and calls for change, protests erupted, uh, you know, when the police officer from Minneapolis put his knee on uh, George Floyd and, and, and killed him, um, as he put his knee on him for almost nine minutes. Um, and and no, Ron, I know you can't speak for all people, all black people, and that's not fair, and, and you don't have all the answers, um, but I appreciate that you've agreed to share your perspective um, and, and help all of those watching, particularly our church, to, to understand and respond to this issue in a more informed way, you know, a way that um, brings us into a deeper understanding of your experience. And, and I appreciate because I, I know that, you know, you've kind of been, you know, from our conversations, you know, you've been trained to kind of put up barriers um, in society, and it takes a lot of, you know, vulnerability and trust to kind of let us to take that barrier down to help us begin working on this issue. Um, and, and, and church, I want to talk to the church right now is, you know, we need to rise to meet his trust. Um, this time, it's not about minimizing differences, but realizing that everyone has something to offer. And Ron is offering us his perspective, his experiences. And if as a church, we want to truly be united, and as a church, we truly want to reflect God, a God who is big, a God who is over all people, um, we need to get the perspective of all people. And, and so I guess I'm just saying to you, church, are you willing to accept what Ron has to offer today? Because he is offering us um, his perspective and his experiences. And if you love him as a brother in Christ, I know you will. And as a church, we'll begin taking a step towards Jesus and a step towards unifying as a body. Now, Ron, we have to sit far apart because of social distancing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't like how that looks, but uh, you know that um, that we're really unified in this, and that that uh, you know when when I heard about all of the when I heard about the killing, you know, I reached out to you um, because you know as you know, as a brother in Christ, when you hurt, I hurt. And, and I think that is the approach that we have to take, is that, that we're supposed to mourn with one another. You know, when, when one part of our body hurts, the others are supposed to hurt and help and support. And so, um, 
even though we're sitting far apart, we're really sitting close together. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, when I, when, when we talked before this, um, how I said, you know, if I ask you a question you don't want to answer or you want to reframe or redirect that, you're free to do that. And I wanted to sort of say that again in, in, in front of everyone because I think, you know, as white people, as, as a white person, sometimes we get really afraid of asking the wrong question. And, 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 and we see that. Some people, get, they, they jump on people for saying things the wrong way. And the problem with that is that if we don't, is then we can get um, some sort of complacent and then not ask the questions that we need to ask in order to grow, in order to gain a bigger perspective. So I think I kind of want to model that where, you know, you ask people questions, but give them, give you permission to say, you know what, I don't want to answer that. Or you know what, you should answer that yourself. Like that's your issue, not mine. And I think that's important because it's better, to, I feel, and, and I want to get your take on this, I feel it's, yeah, it's better to ask a question and because you want to grow and you want to understand than just to sort of, because this is what we've been doing too long, just say, well, you know, it's not that important. This is important. So do you feel like it, I mean, how do you feel about that? Is it better, would you rather have someone ask a question even if it's worded poorly than to just sort of? Well, um, the purpose of a question is to contain information. So I believe it's, important to ask a question coming from that perspective, um, not from not from if you know, you know. If, it, if there's a question you know an answer, an answer to, it's a rhetorical one, why you ask, but right. if it comes to one that you're really not sure about something, it's okay to ask, but just also it's also important to ask in the right way. Um, and, and articulate it correctly because words are powerful and it could be it could be misinterpreted it could be uh, some people overanalyze things I do it myself so I get it but people overanalyze things so it's definitely important to ask certain questions and make sure you're asking in the right manner but also right. as we talked about as well on the, on the phone um, mm -hmm. the phone call that we had um when we talked about doing this on Wednesday, I told him, ask me anything. I, I was like, no holds barred. Just ask me what you want to ask me. And that's the only way we're going to learn. That's the, only, that's the only way we're going to know. Um, and obviously, you're going to ask in the right manner um, to, to not just to retain the information, but also um, for me to be able to articulate to you what I'm trying to say. So um, I, I have no issue with certain questions, conversations, that's the, there's not a discomfort in me. I admire people asking questions instead of assuming or labeling or stereotyping mm -hmm. or saying this is this is how it is because this is what I saw uh, on TV or whether uh, whatever it was. But um, it, things can get skewed like mm -hmm. that, and that's not um, that's not educating yourself. Right. By sitting there watching TV or depicting certain things from TV, whether it's um, one channel that's promoting this, another channel that's promoting this, and then you formulate this is how the world is. No, that's not how the world is. Um, but I believe experience is the best teacher. So, and also self education as well, um, uh, and reading and, and, and learning things and being informed. Um, and the news doesn't always do that, the news can also distract people as well and also don't forget in the midst of all this going on this is a very serious issue and topic over 100,000 people died in the pandemic um, that's still going on um, so please let's not forget about that because the news doesn't talk about that at all pretty much and, uh, and a lot of those people are either African Americans Latino mm -hmm. yeah there are others as well but um, to a great degree, a lot, a lot of people of my race and um, and similar have been um, have lost their lives. Um, right. So you had a, a aunt, right, or you had a loved one who in New York who died of the COVID nineteen, who, right? Who had it, but she made it. Oh, through. okay. Thankfully, she made it through. Um, but she was in the hospital. Um, for that, and my and the other aunt we thought had it. The other aunt they're talking about. 
well, she had it, but she, um, but she thankfully did. But there were other um, health concerns that that came up. But she's out of the hospital. Both of them out of or out of the hospital, thankfully, and doing better. Yeah. Um, which is which I'm grateful for. Good. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that, that, yeah, it's not just people can pelt you with questions or whatever, but a sincere question of someone wanting to learn and grow. Uh, and I think that's where we have to come at it is that, yeah, if we're going to be combative with our questions, then don't bother. But if you really want to, you know, to dig in and stuff, but, but also realize that, you know, that it's okay to push back on those. So I, I guess the first question I wanted to ask is, you know, when you saw what happened to George Floyd, um, how did you feel? It was a ton of emotions, um, and still are a ton of emotions. Um, first, I just felt like it was it's sickening how a human being can do that to another human being, um, and 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 to have three people stand there with you, um, who didn't intervene. You know, there were bystanders who intervened more than the people who stood there. And actually one of them were fending off the the people who were asking him to check his pulse, check his pulse. Um, because that person had expertise in that. And um, they were fended off and almost got into a physical altercation. The gentleman, uh, I saw him on the news the next day, who was just, he was still, torn apart about it. Um, but it's sickening, disgusting. Um, it was heartbreaking, hurtful. That could have been me. That could have been anyone. That could have been my brothers. That could have been one of my friends. That could have been my father, stepfather. So it really, really it struck a chord in me and just how how this gentleman is yelling, yelling, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. It took me back six years ago. So where Eric Gardner, if you don't know him, please look him up. But Eric Gardner said the same thing. He was saying, I can't breathe. And he was placed in a chokehold by officers and he ended up dying pretty much right there in the scene, just like George Floyd did. And um, but what also really stands out is that that officer just seemed like I didn't see an ounce of remorse in his face and his eyes. It just seems like the person under him who he has me on wasn't even there. And that really that really just I was angry. Still angry at times about it. And I have to channel that in a positive way and try to um I wouldn't say suppress it, but um redirect um that anger um and that just disappointment because it just seems like a revolving door for us to see someone who was saying the same thing six years ago, to see this happening again. Now, and not that these are the only incidents um, that have happened, but just hearing him say the same thing and then him pleading for his mom. When do you hear a grown man pleading for his mom? Mm -hmm. um, this guy is 40 something years old and pleading for his mom. That just really, that really, that really just blew me away. I only watched the whole video one time. I watched the entire video one time, and I don't really want to watch it again. Um, to be honest, some people can't watch it at all. You know, my wife, she can't watch it. She doesn't want to see it. You know, she sent it to me, but it just, it stirs up. It stirs up so emotion, so so many emotions um, from that. And just reminded of where we are today. This is nothing new. As a black person, an African-American person, it's nothing new, to be honest. This, we're going 400 years of this, not 20 not 30, 400 years of this, and it still exists. This hatred still exists. No, racism still exists. And racism is on other ends too. I'm not saying, oh, it's not a, oh, white people are racist against blacks. There's racism even towards us, even from other races as well. It's not just, it's not just one race when it comes to that. And yeah, there's some black folks who are also racist as well. But, but when it comes to on a grand scale, when it comes to we're talking about slavery, we're talking about civil rights, we're talking about equal rights, and just for us to be, just I know as as a black man, I know I have to I have to work and 
do things three, four, five times harder just to equal, just to get to the same level playing field um, as a white person would. That's reality. I know that. If you don't know it, wake up because that's the truth. And um, and yeah, it hurts. It drives me more to to want to um, to to want to persevere in life. Mm -hmm. I don't let it hold me back. Um, even though the cards are quote unquote stacked against us in a lot of cases, um, and that's not to say as a sympathy card. That's just the reality of it. I know it. If you look at uh, the way the world is, that's how it is. And um, I'm just I'm just one person who is. Who, who does my best to try to educate others and help change with that uh, because that's something that's ongoing centuries long. Mm -hmm. So what, so that's how you felt with, um, you know, when you watched the, you know, George Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. um, what about your feelings um, on the protests now, the riots, all, all of that stuff? So as far as the, the protests go, um, the protests, rioting, looting. I mean, yeah, on one side here, there's there's people who protest. Protesting in a positive way is to create change um, for voices to be heard. Um, and we're protesting. Protesting is not the intent is not to have a negative outcome. And um, there are people who are protesting, and not just blacks, but people are protesting even for blacks more than I've honestly ever seen in my life right now at this moment in time, ever in my life. Everyone is upset, not just not just my people. Everyone is upset. Um, most people uh, are upset, not everyone, but most people are upset. And I've never seen, I've never seen just as a country, us be at this point where. Is I think we're turning a corner. I hope we're turning a corner, but um, just the impact of these deaths, um, even even for my Aubrey, who who um, which was a big thing like three weeks ago, even though it happened in February, but the video came out um, last month. Um, I think the timing with that video coming out and the timing that what happened with George Floyd, um, those two incidents collided, and I believe. People just said enough is enough, and um, so there's two camps: there's protesters, there's people who riot, there's people who are looting. The people who are rioting and looting almost are never the same people who are protesting. So please understand the distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. Don't group black people together because you see them in the daytime at three o'clock protesting, and then you see someone at ten p.m who's out there at 10 p.m. bashing the windows and stores, running out with goods, whether it's whatever it is, Target, mm -hmm. Stop and Shop, sneaker stores, wherever they go, um, and burning things down, throwing things at cops. Those are two different camps. Mm -hmm. It is not the same thing. So understand the protesters are looking for change and looking to be heard mm -hmm. and not heard. And so looters, people are rioting. It's totally different than um, than than the protesters. The looters, the rioters, they have a different MO and it's not positive. It's not about change. It's about what can I get? Can I get mine? And that's what it's simply about. Um, and it goes for anyone who's protesting, not just black people are protesting. Um, all races that are protesting you know, those are the people that are looking for positive change, and I respect that. I respect, I respect people for doing that, and um, or people who organize that. Um, so there's no, there's no negative connotation overall when it comes to protesters. I don't want to get so deep into this, but I will bring it up though because there are people. I just use, I use uh, Minneapolis as an example. You know, people are protesting. There are people who come there from out of town. Um, some come to protest. Some come, and this is this applies to all cities. I'm just using this as an example. But people come to all different cities, and some 
come with the intent to cause harm. Some come with the intent. These are the looters. These are the people that are rioting. So this, these are even the protesters. Um, so you get those bad apples because um, they're just trying to create distraction and to make people interpret, oh, these people are doing, these people are doing the right thing. These people are trying to, um, trying to make a point in a negative way or get, get labeled as whatever it is, thugs or whatever word they want to use. So keep in mind that everyone who's protesting isn't always from that area. And there are people who come there to ruin cities. And it's happening in some cases, even in Minneapolis. Um, you know, you have private owned businesses, some black owned businesses. And now, and this is even in New York too, but you have people who have to build back from that. Some people can't build back. Things already been shut down. So now you're putting people 10 steps back or their business will never thrive again or business owners getting killed who are looking out for the community. That's heartbreaking. So there are all those people who are like the infiltrators who come in to, um, to create that distraction, you know, smoke and mirrors to make it seem like, make it seem like, oh, that's what they're doing. This is not about change. They're just looking out for themselves. Those people are not the same people. So please understand that protesters and people who riot, people who are looting, it is not the same. It is not the same. They're, those are two different groups of people. So pay attention and don't let the news um, make you think otherwise because you can definitely be um, distracted or thrown off by that. And I think too how like people, you know, and often, like for me, I'll say, well, you know, we need to address uh, racial inequality, racial injustice, and people immediately say, well, what about the riots? Well, yeah, that's wrong too. Like, but you by jumping to the riots immediately, and like you said, not making a difference between legitimate protest and rioting, you also then um, you jump over the presenting problem, right? Like the, the presenting problem of of uh, racial injustice. And so we can hope, we can say, we need to address racial injustice and looting is wrong. It's like, and I think in our culture, in our, our times, it seems like people automatically put on you like all of their preconceived notions, right? Mm -hmm. So that if you say something like Black Lives Matter or whatever, they'll immediately say, oh, you must be some flaming liberal or something. Well, then, no, it's like you can, you can hold that there is racial equality that needs to be addressed and say that looting is wrong. But in our culture, it just, in our, in our news cycle, it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, lend itself to that. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that point too, but also what I didn't get to mention is the thing about people who are looting and people who are um, out there rioting. One, I don't condone this by saying this. Also understand that People are frustrated when it comes to the impoverished communities like this. This stuff happens so often. People are mad. People are upset. People don't really know how to release this. Is that the answer? No. Some people, they don't know better or do know better and should do better. But one has to be in the shoes to understand that. People are angry. People are upset. We see this too often and you have things happen and people killed on video and people walk away not guilty. People walk away not guilty. In videos, you see someone that blatantly was killed and people get off. Not even, not even sometimes they don't even go to trial, but they, they just be able to walk freely um, after taking someone's life. Some people have family. Some people have, some of them have kids. That's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. And that's, it's, it's just, it's happened so much where it's always, it's always that straw that could break the camel's back and everyone has it, everyone has a certain breaking point. And the breaking point has happened. And yet we, we've seen this movie before. It's, it's, it's the, the killings that happen and then the protests or the others who are rioting and looting, and then it's on the news, and then it disappears. We're over that part. 
We need real change. We need change. And that's what needs to happen with the law. This needs to go into law. Like laws need to be changed. Excuse me. Training is training needs to more training needs to happen um, for as far as law enforcement goes. Um, but as far as Black Lives Matter, if you ever hear Black Lives Matter, or if someone posts that, or if someone is talking about that, understand that if your response, if your immediate response is all lives matter, you missed the point. That has nothing to do with black people being better or superior to anyone. It has to do with black people being treated one um, unequal, but also, um, and this goes for this is as far as as far as inequality in so many um, areas, whether it's wealth, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's housing, education, there's so many levels to that. So understand they're about positive protests. They're not about, it's, it's this movement is not about um, about being superior. This, is, this, this, isn't, this isn't the Black Panthers. This is totally different. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the Black Panthers either. Um, and I respect them as well, but this is not a, a matter a matter of stand up to be better than the next race. This is because we're not heard, even when we speak. We're not heard in some cases, even though we we're speaking just as clear and loud as others. So, black lives do matter, and understand that. And if you understand that, you, I'm not asking anyone to support it, but understand where they're coming from when we talk about Black Lives Matter. That, of course, all lives are important, um, but ours are less important, and that's why this movement came up, and it happened back when Trayvon Martin, if people don't know who he is, can look him up, that was killed um, killed in the South, um, going to the store. Had Skittles in Arizona, drink, and got killed by a neighborhood watchman. It wasn't even a cop. So I won't say his name because I don't give credit to um, people who um, exhibit hate. But that's where Black Lives Matter really took off was back then, um, which was like 12, in 2012. Um, so please understand um, that Black Lives Do Matter and it's a movement. It's not a, it's a, and, the, and the movement is about positivity. Also, as Eric Garner, um, who 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 got killed six years ago, his sister, I believe it's his sister, who's part of that movement and one of the people in the front lines of that. So, <clears throat> how um, your personal interactions with law enforcement? What do they look like? What are you thinking during those interactions? Because I think sometimes, especially you know, from a white perspective. Uh, you know, we can think of like, oh, these are, you know, these are just isolated incidents. But personally, like, what do what your interactions look like? Because I think if we go in your shoes, we would, uh, if, you know, if I were to go in your shoes, my perspective would probably be different. Um, so your personal interactions, what are you thinking, you know, in your interactions, what have been some of your interactions with law enforcement? Um, so racial... Um, as far as being racially profiled or um, just to be specific when it comes to racial profiling, that's nothing new to me as far as law enforcement goes. Um, and it's, it's nothing new to many people I know who have, who have experienced that as well. Um, so my interactions overall, um, to, to answer to answer the question as far and in between for the most part um, but when it does happen I know that I'm already a target before I'm a target if that makes sense I already know from the moment I walk out my house I know I'm a target from the moment I walk out my house I know that something can happen just simply because of the color I am and that's just the way it is, and I'm aware of that. Um, I'm always cognizant of it, just because I know that I have to 
it's, it's always good to conduct yourself in the proper manner, but also understand that how to conduct yourself when it comes to interaction with law enforcement. And so I just give an example as if if I'm pulled over by the, if I'm pulled over and um by law enforcement, I know if you don't mind if you use that as an example. I know there's things that Pastor Joel is not gonna have to worry about and I'm gonna that I'm a, that are already in my mind. If I'm pulled over and I don't know why, one I wonder why it happened, but also I know that I need to be as composed as possible. Even if even if I'm even if I'm antagonized to react different, to react ignorantly, to react in a negative way. So I know for myself, if I'm driving, usually we have to drive up here anyway, but if I'm driving, I know once I once I get pulled over, the f- first thing I do is either put my hands on the steering wheel or I put my hands in my lap because I don't want to get accused for me reaching for anything. And I wait. And usually I turn the car off so they know that I'm not going to take off. So at that point, after that, what I usually do is wait for the officer to speak to me, put the window down, because I'm not going to show that I'm being resist- resistant or um, trying to be combative about it. You technically don't have to put your window all the way down, but I'm not going to even get into that um, topic. But um, but I wait to see what the what the officer asks, what what they're asking me, and after that, I usually they ask why you pull, why was I pulled over? Um, if I don't know, I tell them I don't know. If I did, I would say yes. Um, and I would, if they ask for my license and registration, I don't just reach for it. I I I ask the officer. Can I reach for my, my um, can I reach for my, my ID for my license? It's in my pocket. Or I say, can I take my seatbelt off so I can reach for my license? I'm asking all these things. These are steps I know I have to take to possibly keep myself safe. Because I'm thinking the worst case scenario, I can get shot. That's what I'm thinking as officers is walking up to me. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not afraid of I'm not afraid of law enforcement. I'm not afraid of people. Um I'm concerned about my life. Um, that's what it comes down to. So after that, if I have to reach for my registration, which is in the glove box, I would also ask, can I reach for registration? It's in the glove box. And I tell him where it is, or her, where it is, and I'll reach for it. After that, I'll sit there and wait. And I don't make any other moves um, until they come back, or even while they're in the vehicle because I don't want to get accused of moving anything around. And honestly, if they if they ask, can they search me? Um, which some people would disagree with, but this is me, so I don't care what other people think about this, but I would agree to. I have nothing to hide. Search me. So the back draw to it, yeah, things could get planted. They could have something in their hand, big in your pocket. Oh, this is what you have. So now you're fighting a case that you are innocent of. But I'm, I look at it as I'm always guilty until I'm proven innocent. Not like the law. I look at it the opposite way when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. So that's my view on that. How many times in a given year are you pulled over? Um, to be honest, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen up here as much. Mm-hmm. Um, because like population wise, there's less people in New York when I'm back home. Um, it, it happens more often than 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 it does up here. Um, and typically, when it does happen, I'm usually with my brother Lydell because I'm usually in his car. Um, and he got his car all done up and everything and paints it and everything and it's loud it's loud so no offense bro but I'm just saying but it is <laughs> but but it's an attention getter like you will know if that car was coming down the street um but that's not okay to pull a person over just because of that but that's when it usually happens um typically when we're in the vehicle um 
There's been several occasions where him and I are driving, minding our business. Next thing you know, light comes on. There's a lot of detectives down there, so you don't always know what, what vehicle is necessarily a cop car or not. And then the lights come on. You don't know why we got pulled over. So, um, it, it, it happens a few times a year at the, the least. It happens a few times a year. Um, and the same thing. He's the same way. You want to search us? We don't, we don't, we don't offer them to search us. We, but we're saying if they, if they, if we had asked us to get out the vehicle, which mm -hmm. kind of follows up, I think, on the next question that yeah, you were asking as far as being, um, as far as being pulled over, um, I can I can talk about just this topic <laughs> for the whole time, but we don't have that kind of time. But the last few instances I remember, I was with my brother. We were in a vehicle. Cops pull us over, and it's always this famous line, and I'm sure many heard it. You fit the description, or your vehicle fits the description. Um, that's their pass, I guess, to say, all right, this is why we stopped you. And typically, um, that's a loader, you know what, that's not even, um, that's not even true. Um, but at the same time, we both know, this is not something we were taught. We just know how to, we just know how to conduct ourselves because we've seen this and we know how um, situations can be, have gotten for some, some have done nothing at all. Um, so um, I, we usually conduct ourselves in a proper manner and we, and we actually make sure that, um, that we don't give them a reason to react differently or to want to put us in handcuffs for no reason. You know, um, they tell us, can you, if they ask us to get out of the car, we go to the back of the car, we, okay, it's, um, you know, we, 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 we just, we just wait, and there was a there was a time when I was alone one time driving in the city, and I stopped like two blocks before where I was going because I thought my father was in the store, in the grocery store. Right? This, in the, this was in the Bronx, and and as I drive off, cop pulled me over, and it says that they didn't tell me that my car fits the description, but what they said was that this is a high traffic drug area, a lot of drugs are being sold here. No one came in or out of my car. The only reason why I stopped there is because I thought my father was in the store, but he wasn't, he wasn't in that store, he was further down. So, um, they didn't search me or anything, but I told them why I stopped there, and they, you know, they let me be on my way. The other instances, they let us be on our way, but there was one incident where my brother and I were going up to Maine, we were, we were going to visit our um, prep school that we went to um, in Maine, and we were just about to get across the border. We were, in, we were in New Hampshire, and we were just about to get across the border. We were in his vehicle, and we were driving the speed limit. We were in the same lane. The state trooper saw his vehicle, pulled out, and we both were like, here we go. Next thing you know, they, in the, they, they were in the fast lane, we were in the middle lane, <clears throat> they moved over, and then they still were following us, and then they and then they put the lights on. We didn't do anything wrong, put the lights on. Then we pull over. State trooper asked, my brother, do you know why we pulled you over? And he said, no, officer, I don't know why. And he said, I pulled you over for an illegal lane change. We never switched lanes from the time we saw him to the time we actually were pulled over. Only to pull over. That's the only lane that we cha that we changed to. So, um, long story short, we um, they pull us over, um, and they the the um, the officer had asked us where we were going. We told him where we were going, and then after we told him where we were going. And explain why we were going up there for um, a special occasion. Um, he was um, he, he came back over. Another officer came, and they asked us, "Do we mind if they search us?" And we said, "Fine, yeah." And we gave them our, our ID, um, 
they gave it back, and then they said, do you mind if we search the vehicle? The day was a day like today, weather-wise. It was like today, weather-wise. Um, so they, so so my brother gave them permission to search the vehicle. He said, well, I can search it. And at this point, a third officer comes. <laughs> they had the canine as well. So third officer comes. Um, and the officer said, I can search it. We can search it ourselves, or we can use the canine to search it. And my brother said, it doesn't matter. Either or, you know. But they asked us to go to the front of the state um, trooper's vehicle, which was behind the vehicle we were in. We were there for at least 30 to 40 minutes while they searched the entire vehicle. We were up there for a few nights. Um, searched our, our, our bags that we had. Um, our wallet. Everything was searched. For no reason, they found nothing. This officer was sweating. He was he was in sweat. He was in he was sweating after he was done. That's how much they were really really adamant about finding something. They went from the hood to the side, used some machine to scan it for drugs. Our our uh, luggage was was spread out in the back seat as if that's how we put it. But mm -hmm. it was it was obviously neat and. It was it was all spread out back there. My wallet, everything was all over the place. Um, whatever was in it, business cards, ID, everything was just scattered on the seat. And they left it like that. They didn't they didn't fix anything. They left it like that. And at that point, thirty to forty minutes later, him and I are just conversing back there, like <clears throat> about how ridiculous this is. But we stood composed. We never got upset. We didn't ask them questions. Um, they were, the other, the, like one of them were trying to stir a conversation. Um, we, we spoke with him after they were done. They let us be on our way. And as we, as we were about to go, they had the audacity to want to give us DAP after that. And it was like, really? Like, you want to give us DAP after? <laughs> what do we need to thank, thank you for? Or what do we, this is... We did, you know, because you you, you, you you go higher, you, you be the better person. But um but but what nerve? What are you giving us that for? Like if mm -hmm. what was that? What what was the it didn't it didn't make sense, you know, and people were outraged. Like we told people uh, at, at the school and stuff and other people, they were outraged. But um but this is normal to us. Right. I'm sorry to say. And that, and that's the thing, I don't think I think that, you know, my you know most white people's experience with law enforcement is very, that's very few and far between. And that, uh, you know, if, if something like that happens to us, we can, you know, sort of say, oh, let me talk to your captain, do, you know, all of this stuff and not expect anything. Um, and, and so, and it, you know, I think, I mean, law enforcement is a very difficult job. And, and yeah, for the most part, they do a good job, but you can still say like, no, most cops are good, but that does not mean there isn't a system in place that makes it really hard to um, to just do your business, you know, to go to go about the business. So um, it's that brotherhood that you yeah. have, and I get that brotherhood part. But there's also there's also uh, um, at the same time there's also the 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 point of morals at that, you know. Um, yeah, they have the code and everything, you know. I guess you don't intervene if something is happening. You either help or not help, but you don't intervene with what's going on. But that's not okay, and it, that that should be a one on one training thing that right. they should know about. Like you don't kill somebody for giving for for having a twenty twenty dollar counterfeit bill going into the store. Someone shouldn't die for that, you know. Right, and so do you think that is maybe one of the changes that needs to be made is that there is this, you know, the blue line where, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, that even when there is some, some racism going on or some injustice that the other police feel like, no, I can't say anything, even though, um, you know, because there's plenty of black police officers, plenty of, yeah. also, you know, and, and yet the, it's in that sort of built in the, in the system. It should be some training um, mm -hmm. on that. Um, I don't even know if I call it racial sensitivity training mm -hmm. because that should be a given. People should be sensitive to that to begin with. 
Um, and and there's others that are assaulted by police officers. It's not just it's not just um, you know like I said, it's not just blacks who are assaulted. It's just it's just the the crime and the punishment don't add up when it comes to situations when someone loses their life over this. And you have someone, um, the guy sat in a service at church at a Bible study, I believe, and then killed people and shot him years ago and then killed people. Yeah, he was caught. He, he was white, but he was, he was caught and he wasn't dragged from his car. He walked as if he was going to the store. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah. you're talking about the shooter in Charleston, the, the, the white kid who shot yeah. at the church. Yeah. Now. Yeah. His arrest differs from, well, like, he, yeah, he, he if anyone who, deserved a, neck, a, a, a knee on the neck, it was him, not someone who just passed a $20. Counterfeit. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, that's the Maybe, yeah, Allegedly. Yeah. And so it's like he, he, there's a clear distinction when you see something like that where, Wait a minute, and I'm not saying, and, and and I hope people understand. I'm not saying that. And if you kill ten people, you need to be someone needs to drag you from your car and arrest you because you killed ten people. But if you stole a cupcake from the store, you need to be walked out gracefully. No, you know it's wrong. Wrong. wrong your right is right. Mm-hmm. Um, but but. But I see the distinction when it comes to things like that. Um, or even when, what happened with the guy in Denver, I believe, the shooter in Denver, um, shot people in the theater. But people pay attention to things like that as well. Um, right, and then, and then that affects how you interact because you're, yeah. you know that um, a, a small infraction or even alleged infraction can would cause you a lot more uh, harm than if I did, most likely. Yeah. yeah, I could get hurt for doing for not doing anything. I could get killed for not doing anything, and that's that's alarming. That's alarming. Right. That's a deep rooted problem in the system. So actually, and what what time we got it? Uh, it's seven fifty six. Oh, okay. You need to start wrapping this up. So, but I wanted to get in. How how does it look like? So you know, as a Christian, Ron, mm-hmm. a Christian man, mm-hmm. that. You know, when, when you feel you're treated un, unfairly, when the uh, you, when this happens, this uh, and you see, uh, you know, George Floyd killed, how do you, how does Christ help you walk through that issue? And I don't just mean like a, a the pat answer, but like when you know when, when something first happens, like let's specifically say when you saw a George Floyd killed, mm-hmm. and then you said you felt angry, you felt disappointment. Well, then what's the next step where Christ enters into that and then does something in you? And then, like, where do you end up? Because I think it's important where, you know, we, we do see rioters and all that. And like you said, it's, they, they don't have, a, you, you know, violence and sin begets more sin. But as a Christian man, you're not responding in that way. So what does Christ do in you? Like, what's the process there specifically about, you know, Eric with uh, uh, George Floyd? So as far as 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 far as being brought up, um, just as a kid, I feel like I I was always taught that two wrongs don't make a right. So that's the first thing that's instilled in me when it comes to that. Um, so I don't always try to fight fire with fire um, because that doesn't always end well. But what I, as a Christian, I know that what I do. Excuse me. What I do know is that for me, I know it helps to if I have wisdom and guidance um, to be able to not only and ask God for protection, you know, I ask him for protection, but not just for me, you know, but my family, my wife, the kids, they're going out into this world too. And so I ask for that protection, um, but also the wisdom and to guide me to, to do positive um, I'm not here yeah, trying to be some revolutionary or anything, um, but I know that the spirit has moved me to be more vocal, and so that's something that I know that from the initial happening to 
to processing it. I also know it's important to talk about. You know, my wife and I had conversations about this. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's really emotional, especially for her, you know, and, um, going out into this world and just not knowing um, or thinking of the what ifs. Um, not that we live in fear, but we live in reality. Uh, so that's a big thing um, for me, and just to remain composed, remain level headed throughout it all, because it's so easy to um, let the emotions take over. And I, um, and, and so I try to process things differently um, by, by, by writing things or by um, just by simply processing them on my own or even just having those conversations that need to happen and also educating myself. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do you view when, when you come across someone who is expressing, you know, racist views or whatever, how, do you view that person as insecure, unsure of who they are, uninformed? Um, yeah, as you interact with folks. Um, um, it depends because some people are, it depends on where it was rooted from, depends on where it was rooted, depends on how that person ended up that way, and I don't always know how, but I have to take a step back and look at where is this coming from? Is this coming from ignorance? Is this coming from someone just simply having hate in them? And um, and just trying to discern that and, and see where it's really coming from because and so for some it's um, for some it's an insecurity in some mm -hmm. cases right. and and that hate can usually be insecurity in themselves because it's something that they lack in themselves or may not see in themselves or wish they had um, or or attain in their life or in that moment. And so that's where some of that ignorance can come from when it comes to that. Yeah. And, and how do you, um, again, how do you keep from, again, answering wrong for wrong uh, or even painting with a broad brush? So like we talked about, you, you've had some difficult interactions with, with law enforcement, but yet, you know, how do you keep from just sort of saying, well, all law enforcement is bad? Whereas, okay, there's systemic problems, but not sort of painting the same with a broad brush that you've been painted with uh, so many times. Like, how do you not, you know, how do you guard your own heart, I guess, mm -hmm. um, when you've had these bad interactions, you've had bad experiences where some people go down that road of bitterness, um, but I've never seen that about you. you You've often been quiet, but now you're more speaking, but it's not a, it's not a speaking of bitterness, it's a speaking of no, I want positive change. And so how do you, yeah, how do you do that? Um, how does your faith inform that, I guess? Well, a lot of it also has to do with upbringing. Uh, I know for me, I can't speak for everyone, but I know it has to do with my upbringing and how I was raised. And um, I was never taught to be ignorant. Um, I was never taught to, to, um, to react with hate uh, and um, I think that calmness comes from my mom and my dad um, and others in my family, aunts, uncles, you know, or cousins or even nieces and nephews, that calmness comes from, that calmness comes from just the upbringing and understanding the situation and knowing that I can rise above that situation and not, uh, and, and not, and not lower my expectations to someone who is not giving me mm -hmm. the fear, um, right. my fear do in, in the situation. So that's how I believe I overcome it and just my temperament, you know, mm -hmm. I have a pretty calm demeanor overall. Some yeah. things do take me off, yeah. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I just know that I also have something to lose at this point. I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I, I I can, I, I can lose everything just by an ignorant act. I can lose everything. So I look at it from that perspective too. I'm not a kid, you know, that they are reckless things as a kid, but, um, but I you get older uh, and you don't always get it perfect. Um, but you have to know that it's, 
you, it's not, it's not just me on the line, you mm-hmm. know. Right. And it's Marty on the line. It's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the, the household. It's my job. It's so much to lose. So you know, they say it takes a, they say it takes a lifetime to build a reputation, and only ten seconds to lose it. Mm-hmm. So, not that you're gonna lose it in a situation by reacting to something, but um, some instances that can happen. Right. Right. So I, I know we have to wrap up because we're getting over time, but you know, as Christians, we believe that all people are image bearers of God, um, that everyone needs Christ, that we're all equal at the cross, and that in heaven, you know, Revelation chapter 5 says that around the throne, there will be people of every language, every tribe, every nation, and um, gathered around God's throne. And so I feel our churches should be showing the world equality and what unity looks like. Uh, but that's not usually the case. Uh, so, so what, in your opinion, hinders the church from stepping into our high calling? Um, I believe this one thing is complacency. I believe that people, in some, in a lot of cases, can be comfortable where they are and feel like that's not my problem. Mm-hmm. My life is okay. It's not my issue. So therefore, I shouldn't have an issue with this or I shouldn't have a concern with this because I'm not affected by it. And that is a selfish mentality, but that also is reality in some cases, not all cases. Um, so that's that really holds the church back um, and, and it holds people back and that could be infectious. And it, it, it's easy to, to feel that way. Like, oh, this happened? Okay, right. better done than me kind of thing, and just go on with their lives. So that's not what Christ is about. If you right. created His image, it's about love. It's about it's it's about togetherness. It's about unity. And people have to understand that it's it's the the it's always greater than oneself. Yeah. Um, and that's what just like with Jesus and his, his, Jesus and his disciples, he groomed them. He he trained them up. So that when he was knew he was leaving, that they would be ready, mm-hmm. and so they were prepared. It wasn't just a him thing; it was a we thing. It was always a we thing when yes. it came to him. Yes, and I think that we um, that we need to, you know, like as a pastor, I often criticize the church, but I criticize and say we need to do better at supporting our black brothers and sisters. Because I love the church. You know what I mean? Is that sometimes, or even our country, like we, we criticize the country, say our country needs to do better. And it's not because we hate our country, it's because we love it. And we know that they, we have a, a high calling and we can be better. And so we call it out for something better. And, and like you're saying that we, we, we want to grow up into all parts of Christ, right? And that we can't do that if we allow our brothers and sisters, if they're hurting and we're not mourning with them, we're not, and, and again, it, it's, to me, it's, the, it's basic that, you know, Ron, when you're hurting and, and you're feeling uh, the, the, the injustice and the op- oppression, to, like, I'm called to mourn with you. You know, I, I'm called to come alongside you. Um, and, and as Christians, just because we don't experience something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, so that just because I haven't uh, experienced, well, maybe once when I was younger, uh, <laughs> but we'll get into that another time, you know, being sort of profiled by the police, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so I think we need to do better as a church if we truly want to show that unity of the body that, that at the very least, yes. you know, if you're upset, then, then I should be coming alongside of you. And we need more of that. Um, and so much we automatically pitch things into political camps. It has nothing to do with that. The, the Bible is clear that we're made in the image of God, so racism is a sin. Like, why, why can't we all just agree with that? Why do we have to jump to, well, this is a sin? That's, well, yeah, it is, but so is racism, you know? And, and, um, and so I feel like as a church, and I don't mean our particular church, but the church in America, that we have dropped the ball on this. And that's why often there's black churches and white churches. Why? Well, because the white churches haven't supported their black brothers and sisters. And so just a sort of a final question, though, is, is you know, one of the questions I ask is, what's it like 
to negotiate in a mostly white setting? Like, how do you feel? And because that's our church, we, we there's we we're a majority white church. I mean, mm-hmm. we we have other, um, you know, minority groups, but we're still a majority. And and yet, you, I feel like, you know, you, you thrive in our church. Um, but that's my perspective. <laughs> how is it like negotiating in a majority white? thing what are things that you wish we knew were um of all I was well I wish everyone knew how it is to even walk ten steps in my shoes. I wouldn't mm-hmm. even say a mile mm-hmm. in my shoes and understand that is deeper than um is is deeper than race. It's it's that it's that journey. It's the struggle. It's um, it's it's the perception that's given in the outside world, um, just just by simply being who I am and walking in and out of the door. So I don't I don't navigate myself differently in that building amongst a mostly white population. Of people than I would on the corner back home in the city. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of like I, I'm me. I am who I am. Mm-hmm. Except me or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not there for the people. Mm-hmm. I'm there because God led me there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, 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 the, and the testimony to get there is what led me there. So it's bigger than the population that's there, it's about God. It's yeah. about this is where God wants me at that moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see past. I don't see past that aspect of it being a predominantly white church. I chose to go there. I choose to go there. That's my choice to go there. So therefore, I know that that's where I'm led. And so, I feel like, like I said, I'm accepted or not accepted, and mm-hmm. and. If those who care to speak, so be it. If those who care not to speak, shame on you. You shouldn't be in that building because um, it's if it's for reasons like that. If it's for reasons of me being different, mm-hmm. then shame on that person. Mm-hmm. But um, that's not gonna stop me. Um, you know, not that I, not that I, the majority of my interactions have been positive. Um, so that doesn't take away from a few um, that weren't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I know it's big. It's, it's about a me and God thing. I'm there to worship and to fellowship. I'm not there um, because of the people. And hopefully the people can see and, and also have conversation about my perspective or understand where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. Well, we've gone way over time. Um, and so I know there's some things we, did, we didn't quite get to, but uh, I want to quickly so that um, just you, you come up with an idea that the jogging, um, jogging for justice, and that's sort of one of the steps, positive steps you've come up with. So quickly, just because I think some of us are thinking, well, what, what can we do next? And so this would be one thing that we could do. Um, and so just describe your idea of jogging for justice. So jogging for justice is something that um, I believe was put up, God put on my heart to do um, this past weekend um, to um, not not just to unify us but to, um, to also start conversation I know we can't all be together with social distancing going on and everything but people can still um, participate in this and Jogging for Justice is an event that I'm having on Sunday um it can happen from your home. You don't have to go anywhere. You can be right in your backyard. You can be on your street. Or you can go wherever you would like to go. There's no central location that we're going to be meeting at for this. Um, we may do it on our own as a family. Uh, but what this is, is this is a jog slash walk. Either one. You can walk or jog. And the purpose of this is to... Um, Pay tribute to all injustice, those who have been, um, those who have lost their lives or have been wronged 
um, due to injustice, mainly in the black community. Um, and the purpose of the time is because um, this job slash... It's at 2 o'clock. It's at 2 p.m., yeah. Mm -hmm. At 2 p.m. on Sunday, wherever you are in this country or world, that's where you can, where you can do it. And it's going to be for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, I believe it is. Um, 8 minutes and 46 seconds um, to pay tribute to George Floyd. Um, that's the purpose of it. So it's less than 10 minutes of your day, but it's for a purpose that goes beyond that 8 minutes and 46 seconds. So um, that's the purpose of me picking that exact time due to that. And also the jogging part is um, paying tribute to Ahmaud Aubrey, who was also killed while, jog while jogging in his neighborhood um, in Georgia. Uh, so that's the purpose of me adding those two together and kind of combining, combining, combining it. Um, and and after you're done with the walk or jog, just take a moment of silence. Either get on one knee for nine seconds, or simply stand there and bow your head for nine seconds to pay tribute to those folks, to their families, and to all injustice. So that's what the purpose is of this jogging for justice um, event is. And going forward. Um, I'm thinking of the next thing. I'm writing things um, about about um, racism and um, and being and being black, being a black man. Um, I started that poem this weekend. I've written a lot down already, and I'll continue to. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and and if we participate in that, we can tag you and put it on Facebook and stuff yes. like that. So yeah, two so two o'clock. My face on the name is right here. Right, Ron Black. <laughs> uh, so two p.m. on on Sunday, uh, the eight minutes forty six or forty seven seconds, yeah. right? And, and that commemorates how long the, the the officer's knee was on uh, his neck jogging was for uh, the men in in Georgia. And I think that's a very positive thing that we can do. And and you know as I think you know as we close one of the as a, I think as a white person, right, some of you might be thinking, as I am, what work should I be doing? And, and I think the temptation is to kind of say, well, you know, Ron's going to be my black answer man, right? And, and I think that's kind of lazy, and I think it's not right for us to demand that you do our work for us. Like, you've already taken a step out, been vulnerable, put things out that, that, that you know, you, you went out on a limb tonight. And, and um, it's not... You know, we need to do our own work. And, and, and so, you know, I would suggest that uh, one of the things that you could do is, is educate yourself. Um, there'll be, I'll put links up on this Facebook page. Um, there's, there's a book that I, that I found very helpful, The Color of Compromise. This talks about uh, the American church and our sort of complicity in some of this uh, racism. And um, it's on Right Now Media as well. So you don't even, if you don't like to read the book, there's... You can go on Right Now Media and watch the videos, and then there's other videos that will be made available to kind of educate yourself as, again, as, as a white person, like, what, what do I do? Again, we, we, people have done research. People have done the work, and so now we need to do the work to, so that we understand better because um, you've already run, helped us in this, um, and that understanding that, you know, you've experienced certain things and certain hurts, um, and that if I understand those a little bit better, I understand you I, a, a little bit better, and then I'm able to come alongside you, you know, and, and, and empathize and truly be a, a, a brother in Christ. Not just a, oh, I see you at church and I'm going to wave to you, but rather someone that if, if, if you're in trouble, I want to stand with you. If you're hurting, I want to hurt with you. But we can't just jump to that place. I think for, again, as a white person, one of our reactions should be, uh, let me dig into this. You know, let me in. And so there's so many books uh, out there, and I'll, I'll make some of those available on our, our website. Because um, I know that's what many people, I think, are thinking, on the, you know, who are white, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. And also participating in this uh, event that's very positive, uh, you know. And, and, and again, um, I, I just appreciate how you've been you know, vulnerable and kind of letting us in on, on some of this uh, stuff. Is there any other final things that you want to say before we close in prayer? Um, I just want to tell everyone to to 
to wake up, you know, we're way in a different season, a different time right now, and things are changing, things will change, but I also know, I also started a, a private Facebook group as well, and I, I thank you for not just the support of my family, um, um, but also friends as well, and, and mainly people who are white, who a lot of people in my group are white, and it's that's the way it's done because I need your voice. I need for y'all to, to to support us and be behind us in this. The black voice is not always heard. Um, it doesn't go as far. So I really need the support of all people, and that's not singling white people out. That's just saying I know the reality of it, and I really need that support and that's the whole purpose of this the group is not to debate things not to criticize or put people down it's about positivity and about creating change this happens with the law the laws need to change and um and i thank you not just people from the church as well but everyone who have reached out whether it's text call me um and people who have wrote to me on facebook and social media thank you so much um and for Pastor Joe even reaching out, not just the email, but calling me on Monday um, to, to ask me to do this. Um, I didn't think twice about it because I knew it's something that needs to happen. I, it, it was why shouldn't I do it? Um, and so I'm very thankful for that and for those who, who are taking a look into where I'm coming from or as a people where we're coming from. Thank you again. Right, let's pray. Dear God, um, we put this situation into your hands um, in our country. And Lord, we know that you need to change hearts and minds. And, uh, Lord, we know that there's sin problems everywhere, but we want to especially, Lord, not shrink back from the sin of racism and the sin of, of, of inequality. We pray, Lord, that we would be agents of change. And I, I pray, Lord, as a church, we would support Ron. We would, um, Lord, we would love him. And not just because he's one of our church family. Lord, we would, we would love everyone made in your image. That's your call. And so, God, help us to be better. Oh, Lord, help your church to grow into your likeness. And, Lord, heal us. Show us. Give us wisdom in the steps to take. And, Lord, no matter where we come from, whatever background we have, Lord, we know that you want us to bring, bring us into unity in Christ. And so, Lord, we rejoice in that. We look forward to the day when we'll be around the throne of glory, Lord, black and white and people of every nation and every language uh, praising you and worshiping you because, Lord, you are the God of justice, you're the God of peace, the God of love, and we want to represent you uh, in everything we do. Help us to do that today and the next day, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thanks, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next Wednesday for Ecclesiastes study.